The need for my brain to scour over old maps is one I'll probably never quite understand, but in the same way it's a need that I'm quite content to nourish. I'll often look for something quirky, something that's unexplained, a feature, a route, a line. Whatever the mark in the landscape, there is always a story. A year or so back, we made a video on Dorset's Lost Villages. Now, Ever since making that, I can't stop seeing abandoned settlement and earthworks in Wiltshire. It feels like... It feels like... They're everywhere, literally every corner you turn. Abandoned medieval village, abandoned settlement, abandoned village. Now the video we did back then, I looked at the fact they may have all had one thing in common, one thing that linked them all. So I did the only sensible thing I could think to do. I made a spreadsheet of all the sites I could find. I avoided Salisbury Plain, but outside of that, I found 45 sites. So I set about marking every detail, their location, their elevation, their accessibility, their date range. I felt sure that I could find something that, like the neighbouring county of Dorset, would link them all. And we did find something, but what we did find was completely unexpected. Welcome to the story of Wiltshire's Lost Villages. Take a look at this map. It's an 1831 geology map of Wiltshire by W. Smith. We have the green, which is the chalk, and well, everything else is by and large various types of clay. So if I take my data and I start plotting in alphabetical order all the abandoned settlements on the map, well, you can probably start to see what I'm seeing. A pattern is developing. Are we starting to see the same pattern as Dorset lost villages? Plague hit the island and, well, the villages high up on the chalk, they began to shrink first. We start our journey today on the east side of Wiltshire, south of Swindon, north of Marlborough. Now outside of Salisbury Plain, this is probably the most famous abandoned settlement in Wiltshire. And as we head in from the northeast, just there we get our first glimpse of what came before. The structure there is a water pump used to pump water from a well down below for the village that sat just behind it. If we look at a 1900 map, you'll see that the whole village was still here, a huge population. That's how tangible the history is here. Come and take a look. As we step inside the abandoned village of Snap, wow, there is so much here in terms of earthworks of houses. Um, in fact, right here in front of me now, there's a uh, rectangular outline of an old building. Now there's some brick on the floor, that's interesting because apparently if you find brick, well that means you found the chapel because the chapel is apparently the only building made out of brick. I'm not sure how true this is because this looks quite small for a chapel. So you can probably find out who made them by the diamond shaped marking on them. It's really sort of easy to kind of conjure up images of the generations that lived here. Perhaps the same generations of various families throughout the years, thousands of years potentially. And that's exactly what did happen here. The census records for over half a century show the same family name over and over. But things came to an abrupt stop and the 1901 census, that was the last time these names would ever exist here. So 1905. A butcher from Ramsey, a couple of miles to the south of here, purchased all this land and he converted it from arable to sheep grazing. Overnight, literally overnight, life here would have become impossible. 40, 50 people, this settlement completely abandoned. And then World War I, sadly it was used as target practice and uh, it's left in the rubble estate that we find it today, including this one right here, look at this. Perhaps um, this would maybe have afforded the nicest view across there and if we look across there up on the top of the hill well we have another abandoned village 
this time with a very different geography. A different geography, a different system, entirely different feel about this place altogether. All sorts of earthworks, boundaries, fieldworks, holloways. First mentioned in 955 AD in an Anglo-Saxon charter, corrupted I think by 1200 AD to what it is today, Upham. Let's take on a key word from that, Holloway, an evocative picture and imagery of a route in and out of a settlement. It seems on the face of it that its east-west line should travel through the centre of what's left here today, and that's just the manor and a handful of industrial estates. The sunken trackway stops either side of the manor grounds and looks to be diverted south. An old map from 1773 shows this diversion, and despite a 1500 rebuild of the manor, well, it probably stood here long before commanding its immediate population. It certainly could have housed a population perhaps millennia before. And when you look back at some archaeological records, well, the early 1800s, some antiquarians of their time, well, they found some Roman villas with underfloor heating back just in that direction. There were some Iron Age remains. So it certainly seemed that this site had been occupied for thousands of years. Now, the 1377 poll tax records said there's still 40 people living in that field with all the earthworks there. Now, within 40 years though, things had changed a lot because gone, and this place was now just described as a farm. No inhabitants directly here serving it. Now, that could potentially remind you of the uh, Dorset's Lost Villages, the Plague Villages, because it's about the right time for a dwindling population high up on the chalk here. They were nearly 300 metres above sea level. Unlike Snap, of course. I think we need to look at some more before we make any judgement here. OK, so let's stop teasing you with a geology map. Let's plot the remaining settlements on here. There really seems now to be no significant correlation here with the geology, no pattern whatsoever. We have some low-lying and some high-lying, we have some chalk and we have some clay. We'd best continue our search. Just left the village of Bushton there in the background parish of Clifford Piperd. Clifford Piperd itself sits up there on the escarpment, or just below the escarpment. The escarpment right now is so formidable in its presence, it just sort of commands over this whole area. Now we're about to go across this field here and find two abandoned settlements quite close to each other. A very different story. The entire area here has held home to humans for thousands of years. Roman occupation, Bronze Age barrows north of Clifford Piperd, and even Neolithic tools such as arrowheads were found. And of course, we shouldn't forget the megalithic structures that have been found here in the past, but seemingly no longer remain. Let's head to more recent times, in fact, medieval times. Now, just through there, is where we're trying to get the abandoned settlement of Wood Hill. Proving quite difficult because the pathways around here are absolutely not signposted. The map says it's through here. But there's a deep brook down there, so we won't. But what we're looking for are scars in the landscape. And there's evidence of manor houses, two fish ponds, um, raised areas for cottages, hollow way through the middle. There's a lot to see. Well, they found a way through. That's on, that's an electric fence. You'll find out why in the outtakes at the end of the video. To Wood Hill. Right, here it is, Wood Hill. The word Wood Hill comes from the woad plant which gave you blue dye. Now the lands here were held by a few different families throughout time, the Broome family, the Rortons. In 1923, it was sold to a tenant farmer. And with no evidence for this settlement existing thereafter, we have to assume that didn't work out. Thank <laughs> you. 
right there was Wood Hill. But just a stone's throw away the other side of these farm buildings is yet another abandoned settlement. The village of Bupton, named after William Bubb, 1255 AD. And it tells a very contrasting story to this one. village of Bupton stands just behind me and it does tell a very different story. Now there's a copse just there behind us called Quintin's Copse. It sounds like that was named after the landowners at the time. It takes us back to 1600. Now at that time there was a huge change in taxation laws and the Quintins went bankrupt. They had to sell up the lands and the farms that were here and again almost overnight the village and the settlement here was abandoned. really feel at the moment the connection still isn't that obvious so let's stay in the area and head just a bit further north to somewhere which on a map looks quite spectacular now we've been following this escarpment for the last few miles and itself holds some fascinating stories so just up there is Binnall Castle now it looks Iron Age, it's sat on a triangular promontory escarpment, but there is no evidence whatsoever that it is Iron Age. So what exactly was it? The views from up there on the castle are absolutely spectacular. On a clear day like today as well you can see quite some distance that stands to reason then that soon after the Norman conquest Gilbert de Bretel well he had a lot of the land here and he had nine manors in this valley below it's said that he built a castle and shaped it as it is today to oversee all of his manors and his lands now many of those manors have gone including Binnell Manor just down the hill here and you can still make out the earthworks today and of course the thriving village that was at the time. If we head a bit further south now you'll see there's only one or two houses there relatively new and a farm building or two unlike what it was 600 to a thousand years ago. Between 1200 AD and 1600 AD, various documents mentioned a chapel here at Binnell, even back then describing it as in a pretty sorry state. So when the owners of Binnell Cottage were doing some landscape work in their garden a decade or so ago, they noted the remains of a building. Archaeologists were called in. Now the various documents had mentioned quite a lot here, including settlements, of fish ponds, manor house, enclosures, holloways. And once the dig started here in the garden, of this cottage where the chapel was found. It's said that it would have looked just like this one we found on the eastern side of Savanac Forest. This is Chisbury Chapel. Sadly though, for the uh, the chapel over at Binnell, unlike this one, well, documents suggest that by 1617 it had completely um, been left into an abandoned state, so for whatever reason the population there didn't need that chapel anymore. And here at Chisbury, wow, this is something else. Never seen anything quite like this before. I think it was used as a barn from sort of 1600 itself onwards, so probably quite similar. So let's take stock on what we've seen so far. We've seen five abandoned villages largely chosen at random. We've seen Snap, change of land use. We've seen Upham, possible plague village, Woodhill, tenant farmer clearing, Bupton, and taxation reasons, Binnell, I'm not really sure. But as with those five, we've just picked one more at random, one last village to visit. Surely we'll find a pattern at this one which fits in with one of the others and we can start to piece all this together. As earthworks go, 
Now, if you've been watching the channel a while, you know I get a little bit excited about earthworks, and this is quite spectacular. I've talked about this before. This is the Wandsdyke, Wandsdyke. The theory behind this is it was built sometime between 500 AD, 800 AD or thereabouts, and it was to help protect the Romano-British from the impending invasions of the Anglo-Saxons. It's really quite spectacular, even though this bit here is only about a metre, metre and a half on the south side. Uh, it stretches in two parts, around about 20 miles across the southern part of Britain. As I say, there are some really spectacular parts. Now, just up ahead of me here, not only is it quite a beautiful picture, but also, well, they're said to be 500 years or so later, an abandoned settlement which straddles the Wandsdyke. Let's go and take a look. We finally just stepped beyond the boundary there into this and most of the land ahead of me now belonged to the abandoned settlement the medieval village of Shaw really high up here on the ridge I think we're over 600 feet or so in to the south you can see the ridge and look down over towards uh, Devizes and Alton Priors and it's so beautiful and even now already I can see huge shaped earthworks maybe um, sort of platforms I don't know, I'm not sure what I'm looking at, but look at this. All here, big straight lined edges, probably houses with a little bit of land for cultivation. And it stretches for quite some distance ahead of me through the trees over there. And we really are in the land of the Neolithic and the Bronze Age up here on the ridge ahead of me. And perhaps the height of this village was part of the reason why it's no longer here. We're over 600 feet up and there's no permanent water source. The chalk beneath us puts pay to that. And there's a Celtic field system to the south between here and Golden Hill. This place was mentioned in the Doomsday Book. And I think about 1300 a church was built. But soon after that, well that's when things started to go a bit pear-shaped for this village. But look at this, the earthworks here wish I had a rough plan of what we were looking at as with so many of these abandoned settlements but I really do feel this looks like a holloway through the middle of this village there's so many old trees as well such a sight this place I wasn't quite expecting this in 1929 there was excavations done some archaeologists wanted to understand more about the village and they found the church and I think the said it was only a nave it was just a rectangular shape there was no extra buildings outside just a nave and as i say built 1300 but within a hundred years of that being built the farms here uh shaw and down at alton priors well they'd apparently merged and this settlement was no longer needed uh, i think all the workers stayed down there now maybe this settlement was chosen um or not chosen as it were because of the uh, the lack of water and it was so high up on the uh, on the chalk here but look at this there's just earthworks everywhere an archaeologist would have an absolute field day here with looking around and just over this way remember i mentioned the hollowway earlier going up through there and it looks like it goes all the way up the back here it may not be a hollowway but goodness me i can't see what else it is a big sarsen stone there but um, it's a few metres deep just ahead of me. So it's quite uniform. I'm saying this is a hollow in and out of the village. So over the last month or so, we visit about 10 of these 45 abandoned settlements. You probably worked out the connection. There is no connection, at least that we can see from the ones that we've picked. I'm sure if we dug deeper and visited more, maybe we could piece some of it together and find some common ground. But that wouldn't help make the point that I'm trying to make. The point is this, this tree is over 200 years old. So that's older than the first moving image. So I'm filming something older than the notion of filming itself. I guess it's really easy to see our lives as a uh, a moment that's forever 
almost. It's the same, it's been the same, and it forever will be the same. That moment, that second, that hour, that day, that week, that month, that lifetime. It's easy to feel that time has stood still. The crumbling walls and the empty streets speak of a bygone era frozen in time here, sometimes for hundreds of years. But the time moves on and nothing stays at the same forever. The people who once called these places home have long since moved on, leaving behind only the echoes of their lives. And yet in some, their stories continue to live on, etched into the fabric of the remains here. And as I stood in the walls of those places, in the midst of these abandoned settlements, I remind myself that nothing is permanent, that we really should embrace and savour a little more. The future holds so much more promise and possibility, even at seemingly the bleakest of times, it too shall pass. And while we may leave behind the ruins of our past, we always carry with us memories of the lives we lived, the people we met and the places we've been. We continue to build new communities, new stories, and leave our mark on the world and the landscape. So savour, embrace, reflect on the beauty of this impermanence and embrace the endless possibility that the future does hold. For in the end, it is not the moments we leave behind that define us, but the memories that we create, the lives we touch and the boundless potential of what is to come. Hey everybody, um, well, thanks for watching first of all. We've, we put a lot of work into that video from the research side to the film and, and we've had a great time. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely. been it's been lovely. It's been something that we've really wanted to do for a long time yeah. and uh, we've only been able to do that because we stepped back a little bit from the weekly film because we wanted to do this type of film and more like it. We've got a lot of different ideas and different subjects so we really appreciate your support and still watching. Mm -hmm. Largely that's been made possible by our Patreon and YouTube members and their support. Thank you very much. We're still doing weekly videos for them but they're unedited so if you still want to see some waffle behind the scenes and help support and become part of the community of our behind the scenes of the videos and the discord server that we have well you can sign up in the links below um, but from me and Rebecca a big thanks we've Thank really you. enjoyed this